Well, it's good to see all the saints and the sinners again. Very good. You notice I looked from one side to the other. You know? <laughs> it wasn't lost. I'm losing my subtlety. <laughs> You're going with the flow. This is too much. I'll have to bring a inject a little more humor into this. I can see that. <laughs> okay, so we're ready to begin this afternoon. And because I've been incorporating individuals into are you volunteering for prayer already? Thank you for having your hand up. Here's the microphone. Would you stand up and, and face the, the world through the medium of the video? Lead us in prayer, brother. Thank you. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. It is fruitless unless your spirit attends us, that we understand what you want us to understand. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciate you being, you had your hand up before I had the question out. How well trained I've got you all now. Thank you, Lord. I wanted you to break from character and tell me who the seven spirits are before the throne. Just hang on one moment while I look in my back pocket here. Oh, you know, I've left the spoon behind. I cannot put the spoon in your mouth. What a shame, huh? I've never been the kind of preacher who sees the congregation as little birds in a nest with their mouths wide open, waiting for me to drop delicate morsels in. That's not my style. Haven't you learned that yet? I have confidence in your thinking abilities. So if you want to know who the seven spirits are, just let the number seven come through. It will come through this afternoon, by the way, if we make progress and if you all agree to prevent me from telling stories. Because <laughs> you know, I am a notorious storyteller and I have a supply of stories like you wouldn't believe. Oh, you do believe it. And God keeps giving me more experiences all the time. But I haven't even started on New Guinea. I can't believe I haven't really told, except for that one where you got the bare facts, I haven't told you another <laughs> New Guinea story. But you know, I'm in danger of God rebuking me because every time I tell too many stories, God goes tap, tap. It's my word they need to hear, not yours. <laughs> but I, I, I might get tempted to tell one and if the resistance is not too strong, I, I may let it come out, you know? <laughs> he did tell a lot of stories, yes. I am a great believer in the teaching style of Jesus. I think it's fantastic. The way he drew illustrations from the simple things of the world around him, powerful, huh? powerful. And I lived, so here I'm starting off already, I lived in New Guinea for 10 years where people had a proximity to the natural world that just blew my mind away. You know, I never, it never occurred to me that you could actually communicate with trees. I mean, that's really branching out, isn't it, to <laughs> communicate with trees. And that's not something demonic, it's a closeness to the natural world. Alan White suggests that the trees are engaged in the worship of God, I don't even comprehend that. But in New Guinea, these people are so close to the natural world. Like my students would be sitting in class and one of them, these are theology students, and the most educated young people in a country where 70% of kids at that stage didn't even get into school. And I'm dealing with kids who've been through high school and they've come to college. And one of my students will raise his hand and I'll say, what is it? Oh, well, pastor, I need to go home to the village. Once they go, they never, I mean, absolutely never come back. You've lost sometimes your best students. I could weep. I'd say, why? And he'd put his head down and say, well, I, I can't say because you will laugh at me. My humor was famous. You know? So I would say to them, well, look, what if I promise and try really 
hard <laughs> not to laugh. I mean, I'm going to really... <laughs> Try hard not to laugh, because I know what he's going to say. Well, my grand this is Tuesday. My grandfather is going to die on Thursday. I'd say, well, there's no mail system. There's no telephones. We do have the drums. How does he possibly know? I'd say, how did you receive this incredible information? And his head will go, Pastor, you're laughing. I'm preparing myself for what I know he's going to say. I said, I'm not laughing, I'm just smiling. <laughs> well, this morning a little bird sat on the tree out there and he was singing. And as he sang, he told me the story of my grandfather. How do you challenge that? And he goes home and his grandfather dies on Thursday. And he's needed by the family, never comes back again. I decided to test it out. See, he, you haven't stopped me from telling a story and I've gone, I'm on one already. I can't believe this, I just asked you to prevent me. So I went out one day and I actually sat under a tree for a whole day and tried to have a communication with the tree. When I got home, my wife said to me, I think it's time we left the mission field. <laughs> but interesting enough, I have a brother, as some of you know, who has lived in New Guinea for 45 years and has not been home once. He speaks to trees. He doesn't speak English anymore. He's become fully a native in New Guinea. He's married to a New Guinean. Well, he's actually married to three New Guineans. He has three wives and 25 children. Well, that's at least the ones that he acknowledges. He has many more, but officially 25. And 15 years ago when the big chief died in his tribe because his number one wife was the big chief's daughter, they voted him in to be chief of the tribe. So I actually have a brother who's a New Guinea chief. You really can't match that, can you? <laughs> a brother, and they fully initiated him into the tribe. He was suspended for eight hours, head down over a smoking fire. And they took 300 pieces of sharpened bamboo and put it like needles through his skin. And they raised the skin up. You may have seen pictures of Africans who have that kind of bumpy skin look. As they raised the skin up, they used hot stones to sear it and give him that bumpy look. His tribal name is the white pukpuk or the white crocodile. He's a crocodile farmer, that's his business. So he actually paid a record price in New Guinea for the purchase of his number one wife because she was the daughter of such a big chief. You may never have thought about this, but with your lovely long hair in New Guinea, do you realize you are at least a 500 pig woman? <laughs> see, see me later if you're interested. You know? <laughs> and by the way, your husband will shave that hair of yours, that lovely hair of yours off every month and add it to his wig, which will just grow bigger and bigger. You may have seen pictures of the wig men. The wigs are coming out like this. He's got many wives and he's proud of it and here's the wig showing it. Oh, you're about a 700 pig woman. Look at this hair here. <laughs> My brother paid 5,000 pigs for his number one wife. She was the daughter. Oh my goodness, I failed to see you. You're a 1,000 pig woman. Look at that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Stop telling <laughs> stories. Okay. So we're in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Oh, yes, and you all left me hanging yesterday afternoon, didn't you? Yes. You people caused me to leave here hanging between heaven and earth. Because I ask you to expand on the theme of Revelation. Revelation 1 1, remember. 
the revealing or the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've already spent a whole day on the unity of the books of Daniel and Revelation. We've seen that they actually make one book. And now we're expanding on the theme in the book of Revelation. It's all about the revealing of Jesus through, through his people, and that's going to come out. But in verses 5 and 6, the theme is expanded. And down on this side, we wrote the three attributes of Jesus, the three descriptions of Jesus. The first one, he is a faithful witness. And the word witness in Greek is the root of the English word martyr, martyr. It's martureo in Greek, martyr. The second description of Jesus was the firstborn of the dead. I'm reviewing now what we did yesterday, the firstborn of the dead. And the third attribute of Jesus was ruler over the kings of the earth. Excellent. Ruler over the kings of the earth. So we have three attributes of Jesus and we had three matching benefits from these attributes and the fact that Jesus was identified as a faithful witness and his death is tied into this. We agreed yesterday that the match to that came out of verse 5. What was it? He loves us. He loves us. He loves us. We are recipients of the matchless love of Jesus because God has demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the first part of the theme of the book of Revelation, which is now beginning to expand, the first part is a focus on the death of Jesus, a great witness, a testimony, you could say, to the fact that God loves us unconditionally. Wow. By the way, is there one person here this afternoon, just one, who is starting to be overwhelmed by the magnificence of the love of God? Especially as, and we've been talking about it all the week, especially as you've come to the cross again today and you've just realized anew that God has accepted Jesus 100% in your stead. All the sins of your past have been heaped on him and in exchange his marvelous robe has been placed on you. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. I think of Ellen White's beautiful statement, he was treated as we deserved so that we might be treated as he deserved. And so when Jesus became sin for us, in exchange, we became righteous. Hallelujah. We became righteous in God's sight. I want to thank God again today, despite what I saw this morning when I looked in the mirror. I moved into belief despite that. And I said to God once again today, Romans 6, 11, I consider myself to be dead to sin and alive unto God. And I looked up to God and I said, thank you for loving me that much. Because I could spend the rest of my life trying to get rid of all that guilt and shame and condemnation. And in one moment of time, you plucked it from me and you put it on someone who did not deserve it. That's embarrassing. <laughs> I didn't turn it off. <laughs> I'm in the middle of a seminar with several hundred people listening in. Do you have something to say? <laughs> Listen, let, let me call you back later this afternoon, okay? I'm serious, yes, but everyone's laughing at the moment. <laughs> Do you hear them? <laughs> I'll call you later, okay? Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>
so funny. <laughs> Very good friends of mine in Ohio. <laughs> Is there one person here who recognizing anew today that God has demonstrated his love toward you. You just want to lift up your heart today and shout it out. Thank you, Father, for loving me. Linda, was that your hand I saw shoot up? Please stand up, would you, and take this microphone. And then the lady behind you deserves a shot too because she was quick off the mark. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in Daniel where the angel comes to him and says, Daniel, you are greatly beloved. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I thought, he loves me that much too. Mm -hmm. And when we contemplate what he's done, mm -hmm. I just feel very loved. Amen. Well, you haven't said anything to him directly yet. Do you want to say something to him? How Thank are you, you God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Please. We were visiting on the way over here this evening, and it come to my thought how wonderful it would have been if we'd have had this information 50 years ago. Oh, hey. When we were oh. raising our children. Amen, amen. Our amen. children, we've lost a lot of our children amen. Amen. because we were so concerned about the length of their dress, yes, yes. or if they had makeup on, right. or if they... <coughs> we understand, all those, yes. All those things. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes. And with this new information, I can even go out and talk to people about this. Oh, wow. Praise God. Without any barriers between you and no. them, just because they're not looking exactly I've, like I've you. I've got right? a plan of action. Oh, wow. Wow. Is the world ready for this lady, huh? <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, that's very, very beautiful. I had a very thrilling experience on campus here yesterday because there's a gentleman who teaches in the academy here now who taught my children 20 years ago in... Shenandoah Valley Academy in Virginia and he approached me yesterday and he said he wanted to sit down and talk so we sat down together and we have known each other a long time and I always respected him as an excellent teacher but he reminded me of something that I had totally forgotten it was parent teacher conferences you know and I drove from Washington DC to Shenandoah Valley Academy once a month every month for eight years while well, I had children in that academy consistently for eight years. Anyway, he reminded me that I came in to see him on a parent-teacher meeting, and he expected me to ask him about how my children were doing. And he said, and you didn't ask me anything about how your children were doing. I said, well, what did I ask you? He said, you asked me are you sharing Jesus with my children? Amen. And he said, I just wanted to know that that has haunted me for so many years of my life that I was educating your children and I had never shared Jesus with them. He said, just, I just wanted you to know that my whole ministry, uh, my whole teaching ministry has taken a turn and every class I teach now, I lead my students to Christ. Amen. And he said, that was the seed you planted in me. I said, thank you, God. I don't even remember it. Amen. He said, you, you, you thank me very much. He said, I knew that you knew that my response was so feeble, but you thanked me and you walked out of my door and I was never the same again. <laughs> Are you sharing Jesus with my children? So I appreciate what our sister here said. I've had to repent for the first 20 years of my ministry and I was not really uplifting Jesus because I didn't know the whole gospel myself. And I was teaching a seminar one day in the Washington DC area and I actually heard the good news myself for the first time in my own seminar. And I just went, we were in Romans 5. 
I thought, my goodness. Oh. I didn't turn it off then. What's wrong with me? That's my Russian son. Dobrovetsi. I'm standing in front of several hundred people. <laughs> Do you hear them laughing? Yeah. I'm in the middle of a seminar. Can I call you back later tonight? I'm anxious to chat with you, okay? Talk to you then. Okay, man, bye-bye. <laughs> Sorry. Now's the time to do it. Because if I knew how to turn it off, that would be helpful. <laughs> well, I'm admitting a lot here, aren't I? <laughs> but I can at least cut it out from ringing. There we go. Good. It will not ring again. <laughs> Put it on the floor and stomp on it, he says. <laughs> Very practical advice. <laughs> This is, this is my, quote, son who's at La Sierra University. So, so God is so gracious that I was teaching a seminar in Romans 5, and the words actually struck me. While I was yet a sinner, while I was ungodly, while I was without strength, while I was an enemy of God's, Christ died for me. I said, oh, hallelujah. All the things I've been trying to do for God don't amount to one ounce of credit because God has provided the way 100% in Jesus Christ. And I fell down on my knees and repented immediately. And my mind from that moment began to expand. And God's been gracious. He forgave me for 20 years of leading people enslaved to sin because I wasn't sharing with them the death and the resurrection of Jesus. How's your faith this afternoon? I do hope and pray, and I've been urging you every day to take hold of these things daily so you have the fullness in you of everything that Christ accomplished in the likeness of sinful flesh. What was the, uh, what was the parallel with the firstborn of... Is that the point we got hung up on as we finished? The parallel of the firstborn of the dead. Stand up and deliver, please. I think it's got to be Romans 6.11. No, if it's not coming out of Revelation 1, 5 and 6, the boat has sailed and you're not on it. Okay, stand up please and, and deliver. The answer will be coming out of Revelation 1, 5 and 6. Don't call out now, our sister's on her feet. She looks as though she's ready to proclaim here. Well, I was looking for my partner and I don't know where he went because we worked on this together yesterday. But it's um, amazing, beautiful. Oh yes, this did come out yesterday. We, we got to it almost. Okay, the, um, he's the firstborn from the dead. That's the second death. We've got the, that here. The only one that ever has lived what through What was the parallel? And what the, benefit came to us through the resurrection of Jesus? He has freed us from our sins Hallelujah. by his blood. Freed us. Yes, because we have been resurrected with him. Freed us from our sins. And what other word was used from freed? Washed. Just hold it for now. Washed. Washed us from our sins. Washed us from our sins. In his own blood, yes, yes. Let that sink in. We've moved beyond his death to his resurrection. And it came through yesterday how Jesus actually washes us. This is not the forgiveness of sins. This is being washed from your sins 
You know, I met a lot of people today that think that Jesus saves us in our sins. The good news is Jesus saves us from our sins. Do you know the first verse in the New Testament that uses the root word for salvation is Matthew 1.21. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. By the way, that is what it means to be. That's what it means to be saved. Thank you. Being saved does not mean making it to heaven. You're already in heaven. That's taken care of. You're sitting there in Jesus Christ already. We read that. Being saved does not mean squeezing through the pearly gates. Nor does it mean living on forever and ever and ever. Salvation is directly related to being saved from our sins. And everything we've studied so far should be telling us that the plan of salvation is based on two great facts. One is an already accomplished fact. The other is an ongoing process in our lives. They are both essential to the whole plan. Amen. Are you on vacation again? Amen. Am I back in a morgue again? No. Wow, how can you sit quiet with a statement like that coming out? Huh? We're awestruck, he says. <laughs> Thank you, Budge. <laughs> I'm going to say it again in case you missed it. Salvation is based on the two immutable facts, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. One is an accomplished fact. It happened at the cross. The other is an ongoing process in our daily lives where we are cleansed, freed, washed, from our sins. And one person sitting here is about to tell me, because I've dwelt on this over and over again since the beginning of last weekend, what incredible plan did God come up with in order to wash us, free us, cleanse us from our sins? Once again, a forest of hands is Marilyn, your hand shot up and then it developed leprosy very quickly. Stand on your feet, please. So. I believe he washed us from our sins. Uh, he washes us daily as we ask for the indwelling Christ within us. We can have victory, and that's the only way we can have victory. You sat down. Now that means you're satisfied with the mediocre response you got. <laughs> Come on, Marilyn, don't be content with that. I want you to say amen. <laughs> Let, let's hear it again. Come on, it takes two or three repetitions in this place to get a response. You know that. Let's hear it again. I believe the way that he washes us is a daily basis when we surrender our will and ask for the indwelling Christ in our hearts, and that's the only way we'll have victory. And this, of course, is the ministry of which member of the Godhead? The Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. And I've spent... How many times have we been over this biblically? I'm not going into it all again. I'm just re Thank you very much for such a clear statement, Marilyn. Jesus comes within. And by the way, I'm going to say it again. I told the story of the Frenchman this morning. Whatever you need at any given moment, whatever attribute of Jesus you need, you put on the mind of Jesus by faith. And God imparts to you that beautiful characteristic of Jesus. You need the microphone. Stand up, please, and deliver. The death, resurrection, and intercession of Jesus. Oh, thank you for that. Yes, thank you. I like that. He's ahead of the pack here. Thank you very much. And you notice we have got three sections here. Three sections. 
He said the death and the resurrection and the intercession of Jesus. It's an excellent statement, an excellent statement. Let's see how it measures up to what we're about to read here now. So here we are at our third one. On this hand, Jesus is described as the ruler over the kings of the earth. And we kind of got hung up on this point last night, or well, we didn't quite reach it, huh? Okay, well now we're reaching it. Thank you, Lord. Can't believe it's taken us this long to reach this point. And someone sitting here, of course, and this is the easiest one to answer, yeah. hopefully. Come on, who hasn't, who considers themselves a low participant? A low participant and following an act of contrition and repentance. And Carol here, who comes all the way from Oregon and MacMeanville and all those kind of places. By the way, Carol, there's a group sitting behind you that are, are here today from the MacMinnville Church. So I was uh, stand up and wave to them back there. Do you recognize any of them? One of them, Ginny, who used to be Ginny McDougall, very old friend of mine from how many years, Ginny? <laughs> from Vallejo Drive Church all those years ago. So Carol, does she have the microphone? Uh, thank you, Michael. Stand up, Carol, please, and deliver for us. Uh, well, it comes from uh, verse 6. Oh, hallelujah, she's in the right verse. Isn't God gracious here? <laughs> okay. And has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. Mm, to him be the mm. glory. Now, right. Don't sit down, Carol, because you've earned the right to an advanced question, which I know from experience you love advanced questions. So what do you want me to put up here? He's made... He's made us kings and priests. He's made us... Kings and priests. and priests. Now, Carol, I want you to look carefully at the description of Jesus here, because most people jump to a certain conclusion here about the word kings. Let it sink in for a minute. Look at the description of Jesus, especially looking at this, and then come over here and tell me what you are now learning about his use of the word kings. Now this is a moment, a rare moment now, because I'm giving you a chance to compare simply this statement with this statement. Well, Carol, let's come back to here and start again. What would be the basic conclusion to come to when you read Kings of the Earth? What are you thinking? They were rulers or rulers, leaders. Right. But uh, when your mind slips over here, what are you now thinking? First of all, judges. Um, first of all, who's being described here? We are. Ah. So I just want to be sure you're hearing this, and I believe you are. We might think he's talking about r earthly rulers. No. He, he's not. No. He's talking about heavenly. Heavenly. Spiritual, in heavenly rulers. She's got to bring the heavenly in there. Is there any possibility that this could be taking place on the earth? It could, through the Holy Spirit. We are his priests. Now, Carol, you've earned the right now to a seminary level question. <laughs> and I know you're a highly educated nurse. <laughs> so let's lay this on you now. Carol, as you go from here, to here, to here. Take us one step further now, because I'm reacting to your use of the word heavenly. What possible understanding now is coming to us of kings and priests? An advanced thought now by comparing with Revelation 1.1. We know we're not talking about earthly rulers. Right. We're talking about God's children. They are called kings and priests. And I'm wanting you to slip up here now and compare with the great theme of the book of Revelation. Well, so, we're, we're made uh, priests with Jesus to reveal him. 
as kind of a third base station. And I know you, how competitive you are, Carol. You want to hit a home run here. <laughs> Let these two words come through and make the link again. I'll give you one further shot at it. I want to be able to say your favourite Hawaiian word to you, mahalo. <laughs> He's made us um, kings and priests to um, reveal Jesus to, through you the Holy so Spirit. You are so close to a great truth. The way you're saying it is not making it crystal clear. If you turned what you're saying around, it might come out as a very clear statement. I agree with what you're saying, by the way. It's a fair statement. It's just not going far enough. The reason God's children are being made into kings and priests are because of Jesus. That's not, that's not a clear statement. Come on, spell it out for me. Is because Jesus. Because Jesus died and he was resurrected and he is king over all. She's on her face in the dust. Her fingertips are almost touching the plate. <laughs> but that's good for me. I wasn't raised with baseball, you know. <laughs> Who wants to jump on her feet? Oh, right next to you. Do you mind passing? You've done very well, Carol. And you can see that Carol is very, very close. She's almost there. It's, it's that Jesus is revealed in his people. Um, and that's, it's Jesus who, who is the king and the priest over the earth through his people. I think you, you've got it. I'm not saying by George she's got it yet. Say it one more time and make sure that you are saying with absolute clarity the reason the people of God are being made into kings and priests is... Is because Jesus Christ is revealed in them. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. You've got to pick these two words up again. Come on. Don't leave them out of your sentence. You brought them in previously. Jesus, who is the ruler over the kings of the earth, is revealed in his people, and that's the you've reason. You've gone back to the... You've still gone back to interpreting this as kings now, have you, on the earth? We've already seen that it's an application to the people of God. Mm -hmm. Come on, restate. I'll give you one third shot at this pie. You are so close. You and Carol are both on your faces in the dust here. <laughs> Um, just that I don't know how any other way to say All right, it. well, you've kind of almost said it, <laughs> but I want a clear statement, yet the reason that God is making his children into kings and priests is simply... Well, it's so good to have you with us. I'm going to let you have a shot at this. It's the privilege of God's people as kings and priests to reveal the character of Jesus, of God, and the in character the heavenly, of Jesus, come on, don't finish the, it now. The character of Jesus is... If you the, don't bring these words out, you've missed the boat. I'm sorry, I can't see that. Well, one of them is kings and the other is priest. Okay. You left them out of your sentence, unfortunately. Otherwise, you had a great sentence. We could say you were on a roll. <laughs> um, it's the kind of clear thinking we associate with Idaho. Kings and, and priests to reveal Jesus to character to the whole universe. Because in order to reveal the character of Jesus... To reveal the character of Jesus, they must possess it. Possess... The character of Jesus. Which would mean they'd have to be... It's so hard for me to get anyone to say this, and you've kind of said all <laughs> around it, you know? You're the closest yet. I'm sorry, I'm not finding the right word. If you're going to reveal Jesus, you would have to be... You'd have to be both kings and king priests. and priest because yes. Jesus was, was king both. and priest. Yes, that's what I was trying to yes. get these two to say. And you both were so close to this. Thank you very much. It's like painless extraction, you know. That? Thank you. This is a beautiful thing coming out here. Jesus, both king and both king and priest. 
I'm not taking any hands at the moment, we're moving on. You would have to be both king and priest if you're going to bring about a revelation of Jesus. And by the way, in the book of Revelation, kings are associated with a royal thing that they place on their heads, which is called a crown. And in the book of Revelation, there are two words for crown. There is diadem, which is the royal crown, worn only by God. There's one other character in Revelation who puts it on because he wants to be like God. That's the beast. But only God legitimately can wear the royal crown. The other crown in Revelation is Stephanos. You can see the word Stephen in there, can't you? Stephanos. That is the crown of victory. The crown of victory. And by the way, there's only one person in the whole book of Revelation who wears both crowns. Jesus, both crowns. The devil may want to put on the royal crown, but he'll never have the crown of victory Amen. because he has been overcome. He will never overcome. This is the crown of victory. I hope you're hearing this. Another word for victory is? I just said it. Overcoming. This is the overcomer's crown. Why do you think all the promises to the seven churches end with the beautiful words, to him who overcometh? If you want to be in the business of revealing Jesus, you'd have to be wearing the crown of victory. You'd have to be wearing the crown of victory. That would make you a king you'd be wearing the crown of victory. And by the way, if you wanted to be a priest, what privilege would you seek for and obtain as your entrance into the royal priesthood and the privilege of ministering with Jesus in and through you? What privilege, what step would you take in order to obtain that privilege. Let's see a hand now. Would that be the robe of his righteousness? The robe of his righteousness. Now you have that here with his... Through his death, the, what step would you take? Well, a priest is an inner, makes intercession. I want a simple step you take to enter into the priesthood. I can't believe after a week such as we have had that I would have to work at extracting an answer like this. Now you've got such a vigorous hand up over here. Stand and deliver, please. I hope I'm discerning correctly here. Simple answer now. Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of his testimony. Yes, you're so. telling me how to overcome, but I'm asking about how to get into the priesthood. By accepting his blood and his death and resurrection. There is an old saying, you should quit while you're ahead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've also earned the right to another slice of the pie. Stand up and deliver, please. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's right. Now, can you honestly believe that you got such a feeble response after the kind of week that we have had here? Of course. They're in shock. No. <laughs> the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> have we not seen evidence of that this week? Amen. We have been laying hands on people asking for the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that they may be incorporated into the royal priesthood and function in ministry with the full authority of Jesus Christ within them. 
We've spent a whole week doing this. We'll do it again tomorrow morning with more people. Amen. If you want to reveal Jesus, kings, which means victory, priesthood, which means an entire life devoted to providing God with a channel to complete his ministry through you. This is the great theme of the book of Revelation. By the way, you should look happy if you're going to raise your hand like that. <laughs> Please stand. <laughs> Doesn't that include uh, intercession, which I have trouble seeing me doing? You know, the, uh, it's a good question, and it's the second time this issue has been raised. Priesthood is associated with intercession, biblically. Yes, they go together. It's a very essential part of the priesthood. Now, I've got a huge question for you this afternoon. If you take too long on this question, once again, you will leave me hanging between heaven and earth, and we have much to cover yet. So please look together and see that you've got a partner to communicate with at the moment two or three people speaking together. If you're sitting alone, repent and link up with somebody else. I'll wait for you to do that. We're just waiting for the sister over here. She's on the edge of her seat. I think she's going to run a race any minute. Okay. Praise the Lord. The Spirit is moving. This is a big question now, a huge question. Look at the board. Da dum. Da dum. Da dum. Three steps, three developments. Da dum. Da dum. Same developments, just expressed differently. Ta -da. If you see them as a whole, and yet allow the three developments to come through, you might see a marvelous picture of something that has great significance. Because this is one whole picture with three sections in it, but the three sections form a whole. It's a very biblical picture. I'm not taking hands yet. You've got two minutes to turn to your partners and communicate. Now, don't sit gazing up into heaven. Don't use. No, I just want you to look at your diagram now. Look at your diagram and see if you can see the whole picture here, the big picture. What is it? You see it already. I eh? will talk to your partners. You've got two minutes. Let's have no non-verbal techniques, please. She must be right in the mouth of two or three witnesses, huh? It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. Three it's a very good thing you've seen. You're on first base. It's one, what, that's one thing that is present, but there's an even bigger picture yet. So keep looking. Okay, it's an excellent thing you've seen. Excellent thing. As you look at these three attributes of Jesus and the three beautiful results that come from him being like that, it actually makes one complete picture of something. Something which contains within it all this, all this. This picture is so incredible, it has within it this, this, and this. You've got one minute left. These are prophetic minutes, one minute left. <laughs> Keep talking. Keep talking. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
All right, now very carefully, very carefully. This is a complete picture of something very beautiful that contains within it the complete ministry of Jesus. This picture has within it the complete ministry of Jesus. And I'll give you a clue. It's the only picture in the Bible that contains the complete ministry of Jesus within it. It's the only picture. It has the complete plan of redemption in this picture. Don't call out now. You know the rules. Is that a hand over there? Stand up, please, and deliver. The sanctuary service. Well, it hasn't, it hasn't, tu it hasn't touched this crowd. <laughs> the sanctuary service. Amen. How many of you saw the sanctuary there? Well, my hopes are building. Thank you, Lord. This is a picture of the sanctuary. The sanctuary is coming into focus. Oh my gracious. What a unique picture this is. Here's the sanctuary. Let me draw it up here. Here's the courtyard here. The courtyard. The holy place and the most holy place. And in the courtyard we have what article of furniture? The altar of burnt sacrifice and the laver here. As we go through this curtain into the first apartment of the building itself, we have three articles of furniture. Down here we have the seven golden candlesticks. Opposite them up here we have the table of showbread with two lots of six loaves of bread there, 12 loaves of bread. And here we have the altar of incense. By the way, let this penetrate oil, bread, incense. Oh, wow. Oil, bread, and incense. We're coming back to that in a moment. Incense. You're supposed to have a degree in hieroglyphics to come into this class. <laughs> And here in the most holy place, we have the beautiful Ark of the Covenant containing, among other things, the Ten Commandments, yes. And above it, the beautiful mercy seat with those angels' wings, gorgeous piece of furniture, representing, of course, between them, those two articles of furniture, the two great characteristics of God which we call justice and mercy. By the way, this is the place of judgment. I hope you know by now that the judgment is not man-centered. The judgment is to bring about a revealing of how just and merciful God has been in all his dealings with sinful mankind. That's what the judgment will reveal. That's why we have justice and mercy here in the most holy place. Now this is an interesting thing, this sanctuary, because in the courtyard, what happened on a daily basis? Sacrifice. This was the place of sacrifice. Which of course is tied together with which one of our three? The first one, yes. The atoning death of Jesus, the death of Jesus. This is the cross here, this is the cross. In here, in the holy place, 
we have three interesting elements, bread, oil, and incense. So I want you to look at those elements, firstly, as natural elements. I want you to look at bread as a natural element. I want you to look at oil. I want you to look at incense. By the way, those three things, I'm looking at natural elements. Now, not their symbolic meaning. We're going to get into that. I'm looking at them as naturally occurring elements. They have three, they have something in common. The oil and how it is used, the bread and what happens to it, and the incense and what becomes of it. These three are linked together by something very common. You have two minutes. Don't sit gazing up into heaven. What happened to the oil here? What happened to the bread? What happened to the incense? They all have the same um, dynamic thing happening to them. You've got two minutes to discuss it. Don't go into vision now. Communicate. <laughs> Communicate. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. I could say it in other languages if you're not hearing it in English. Let me repeat it again. Listen carefully. Maybe I'll say it in New Guinea Pidgin and you'll catch it, huh? You pal all get a hard in talk place belong me pal all get a man merry inside long Papua New Guinea laka. This pal three pal something only carrying one pal same pal something. He stop inside long him. Now who's hearing that? Nobody here with the gift of interpretation, huh? Hallelujah! What did I just say? I said, what did I just say? <laughs> All right, now, what I'm asking is, but you are, Martin, you're on a very good track here. What I'm asking is, what happens to the oil here as it goes into the candlesticks? Don't call out, please. What happens to the bread at, that's on this table and what becomes of the incense here as it's placed upon the altar? Something takes place with each of these three things and at the same thing, the same process we could say, the same dynamic activity affects each one. You've got another minute yet to discuss. Come on, turn to one another now. Look as though you're thrilled with that person sitting next to you. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, listen carefully, because sitting here in the front seat, my old buddy Butch has had a vision, which he is wishing me to graciously hand over to somebody else, but he should know me well enough by now that he's not wiggling off this hook, because he's had a very interesting vision. He's noticed that these three things have something very much in common. The same thing happens in principle to all three. So Butch, come on out here. You need to proclaim this before the whole congregation today. We want you to take us through each, all three, one at a time. But first of all, what did you notice that they had in common? Well, each one of them has to be consumed to be something, okay? Now, hang on a minute. Let's see how many of the saints actually picked that up. Boy. See, it's nothing you guys there. won't need me <laughs> soon. Look at this. <laughs> that is very encouraging. Wow. So you're not unique in seeing no, this, but no. maybe in explaining it now. So take us, what happens to the oil? Describe it to us, Butch. Well, the oil, ha to give its light, it has to be burned. So to give that light, the Holy Spirit has to work in and through us so that in this portion of the sanctuary... I wasn't and, asking you to interpret Okay, okay well, I, I, that's the only way I know the, how. I know. Just explain the natural process to us. Uh, well, oil has to be lit to be consumed. Okay. The incense has to be lit to be consumed. And the bread has to be uh, baked or, I mean, dyed. What to, other words should he be using? So. They know the word is eaten. Eaten, okay. So you have to eat it to 
you know, to consume it, I guess. So well, that's why I said I'm not very good behind this when he's you, there. <laughs> you, you have to eat it to, con to consume it. You to guess, consume it, huh? you have to eat it. You know that. I yeah. know that. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. That is excellent work, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you got an amen, man. You're doing very well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, this is very well done and very clear statement. Very clear statement. All three items are consumed. So I have a question now. It's a very important question as we look at the spiritual significance now of these three things and allow ourselves to consider the fact that they need to be consumed in order to produce light, in order to produce fragrant incense, in order to produce Life, yes, life. I think that's excellent. Amen. You eat bread to sustain life, yes. So symbolically, and by the way, I thought I'd share this little statement with you in case you have any doubts about all the symbols in the book of Revelation. I'm quoting now from that vast volume of Revelation. All the quotations of Ellen White are in this volume. You can see how big it is. <laughs> Available, I'm sure, through the ABC. That's where I got mine. But uh, there's a little statement here. And I'll just give you the page number because a lot of these statements come from manuscripts and things. But if you go have the page number, it's page 458. How can that be right at the beginning? I guess this is not volume one, it's volume two. Okay, Daniel's the first volume. Yes, so page 458. Isn't that interesting? They're treating... Daniel and Revelation as one volume. Wow, that's great. <laughs> and listen to this statement. Let none think because they cannot explain the meaning of every symbol in the Revelation that it is useless for them to search this book in an effort to know the meaning of the truth it contains. The one who knows the meaning of the truth, oh, I'm sorry, the one who revealed these mysteries to John will give to the diligent searcher a foretaste of heavenly things. Those whose hearts are open to the reception of truth will be enabled to understand its teachings and will be granted the blessing promised to those who hear the words of this prophecy and those things which are written therein. Very interesting statement that we have the privilege of understanding revelation. Amen. And the understanding, this is the special series of Dan, on Daniel and Revelation containing only the writings of Ellen White, her comments. So any verse you want in Daniel or Revelation, you can come in here and look it up and see what she, any comments she had on that verse. You know? Two, volumes. Two volumes, this is Revelation, yes. The other one is Daniel. By the way, I'll just read this little statement while we're at it. Listen to this. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy, the other is a revelation. Now listen to this. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but the portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. So the only part of Daniel that was sealed up was not the whole book of Daniel. It's only the portion relating to the last days. So we're probably looking primarily at chapters 8 to 12 of Daniel is sealed up, not the whole book. Interesting comment, huh? Interesting comment. So, oil. As a symbol, you've got two minutes to produce scripture for the meaning of oil as a symbol, biblically. If you've got leprosy, you'll be sitting there without opening your Bibles. I want evidence as to the meaning of oil as a symbol. And don't be shouting out Holy Spirit to me without proof. I need scripture lest I perish. 
let's have this side of the room here do oil and let's have this side of the room here do bread, okay? Oil on this side of the church, bread on this side of the church. And over here on this side of the church, on the ultra right wing, because they're usually more advanced thinkers in the ultra right wing, we've got seven of you. You guys can have incense, okay? Incense here on this side. We'll include you people back there with this side here. You're dealing with incense. So we've got incense over here, we've got bread here, and we've got oil over here. I'll give you a clue on this side here. I hope you're in the Old Testament. If you're not, you're probably going to join hands with the woman in the wilderness. You do not stay in Revelation for this assignment. Because of the shortness of time, I'm going to limit you to just the whole Bible. And I'm suggesting to this team here that you be in the Old Testament. Old Testament. In the New Testament here will be good. And over here you can have the whole Bible. <laughs> Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Yes, yeah, but it's not answering my question. Come on. I want these I want these scriptures now. <laughs> I have one. Are you sharing with your partner? You got it clear together? Yes. Wow. Grace is falling, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good chapter to be in there that she was in. She was in John chapter 6. What a great chapter to be in. Yes, and it's the same thought, isn't it? This is probably a stronger text, though, here, yeah. this one. Mm -hmm. Let's see how the olive harvest is going over here. Any oil being squeezed out? <laughs> so which Old Testament prophet would be a good one to be in on this side of the church? Oh, I think that's an excellent choice. The prophet Zechariah is where I would go to, yes. I'm coming to you first in a minute because you obviously, oh you, okay. So the prophet Zechariah, the gospel of John here. I don't smell any sweet incense over here yet. The New Testament, of course, will be your best shot over here. Revelation 8.4. Revelation. 8.4. What does it say? The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. All right, so at least you've got a reference to prayer in there. there. Yes, there may be another reference in Paul's writings as well. That's a good one though. All right, listen carefully because I think the light has dawned sufficiently well, even though some of you have not had a profitable search over here. Let's listen carefully now. I'm coming to our sister here. Let me find my microphone again. Here it is. Miraculously, it's on here. Do I need to stand? Oh, you need to stand and deliver this. Yes, please. So our sister here is in the prophet Zechariah. Listen carefully now. Zechariah 4, starting with verse 3. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. And then if you skip down to six. I suggest you read the whole passage you or you're going to miss the thing? meaning of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did, what did you say? I suggest you don't skip over any verses here because we need to okay. catch the whole drift of this. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? 
Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? Now you've, you need to go back and begin with the description back earlier. You've jumped to the end oh, of I, it. I want you to read the whole picture here. Okay. So begin with <laughs> verse 2, please. All right. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and its seven lamps therein, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. So I answered, see, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. All right, now, before you sit down, the question that was raised was, don't you know what these are? What was he referring to when he said these? The uh, candlesticks. Go back to verse 3 now. Okay. And the two olive trees. So he's referring to the two olive, olive trees. Olive trees, yes. And he says, what are these? Yeah. And the angel says to him, don't you know what these are? And then he gives that beautiful response that you read out so well there in verse 6. Not by might, not, not by power, power, but by my spirit. spirit. He's Stay tying away. together here the two olive trees and the pipes which flow from them with the spirit of the living God. So we, we have a direct connection here with oil which flows forth through these pipes with the spirit of God. It's an excellent, it's one of the strongest references in the Bible, tying oil and the Holy Spirit together. By the way, by the way, Zechariah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. By the way, listen very carefully. Look at the seven golden candlesticks. There's a central part here. It's hollow. The oil is poured down into here. It goes through and it comes out into the branches. There's a wick. The wick is very interesting. Did you know that the wicks were made from the discarded, dirty undergarments of the priests? the dirty, discarded undergarments of the priests were, turned, were torn into strips, soaked in oil, and set alight. And the candlestick gave forth this beautiful glow. Just let yourselves hear that. Dirty garments soaked in oil, bringing forth magnificent light. And by the way, in Revelation chapter 1, who is standing in the midst, in the center of the candlesticks? All the light that's being generated is all focusing on Jesus. It's revealing Jesus, Amen. who's sitting here and allowing themselves to hear the beauty of this symbolism, dirty garments, wow. filthy rags, soaked in oil, bringing forth light which reflects on Jesus himself. Isn't that a beautiful picture? If ever the good news is in a, a teaching, that's the good news to me. Who's actually hearing the whole picture there and you're excited and you're going to jump up and share it with us? At the back there, okay, a hand. Begin with filthy garments. 
Jesus takes our filthy garments, our dirty rags, and turns, gives Hang on, us our filthy garments, another word for? Our sins. Okay, our sinful nature, our sinful condition, yes. Listen. And he covers us with his bright robe of righteousness. No, you're leaving out the symbols. I, I'm asking for an explanation oh. of the symbols. Okay. You've got to have filthy garments soaked in oil, oil. set alight, okay. bringing forth fire which reflect on Jesus himself. That's what I'm asking for somebody to hear. Now you're on first okay. base. Can you get to second? Let's hear it. Okay. When we let ourselves be soaked in the oil of God's Spirit and the Holy Spirit, then we come forth clean, worst of our sins, and wrapped in His robe of righteousness. And that's the light. All right, you're on third base. I wish you'd hit a home run. You've done very <laughs> well, by the way. Very well. There's just two points that I wish you would make clear. One is the soaked in oil. That's not clear to me yet. Well, if we steep ourselves or soak in this Holy Spirit, then we have the Holy Spirit in us and we're washed. All right, now hold it there. She's done very well. Someone else needs to be on their feet now to join her and complete. The hat lady has her hand up here. On your feet, please. Now, I'm going to give you a clue at this point. The, the, so you haven't heard the clue yet. It would be very wise to hear it okay. <laughs> before you run this race. <laughs> the clue is... I may turn back. <laughs> it's very possible. <laughs> the clue is... what we've been studying. The, that was the picture of the sanctuary. Come on, your filthy garments, you spelled out y filthy Your filthy garments, garments soaked in oil. You, your, your sins would be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All right, all right, you are turning back. It's okay though, hand the mic over. We're gonna give somebody else an opportunity here. Our brother back there, okay, let's give him a shot. This is not an easy assignment, this one. But I'm, I'm just seeing on your feet, please, so we can all see you. I believe that it is the fact that the Lord loves us. Now, you know, listen to the question again, because if you're not on the course, then you won't win the race. Okay. I'm asking for an enlargement of the statement that our filthy garments are soaked in oil. And our sister over here correctly yes. said that they, what was your wording again, that our garments are? Our, sin, our filthy garments are our sins. Are? Our sins. No, but what happened to them when they're soaked in oil? You said it very well. They're cleansed. That was the word you used. They are cleansed by the action in the sanctuary, by Jesus' doing and dying for us. And as a result, they the fire of the Holy Spirit makes us witnesses to where All we're right, like no, a no, city hand, on the hill. Hand the mic over. You've left out the essential ingredient. Everyone thus far has left out the same thing. And I have labored over this point. I've probably said it 500 times since last weekend. Let, our brother here has a hand up. Please stand and deliver. Okay, so first I'm of asking all, simply for an explanation of our filthy garments soaked yes. in oil. That's all I want. Okay. I see the filthy garment as us. And Let's come out the, clearly. When the, when the threads of the garment soak up the oil, that's the Holy Spirit coming into us, okay? In oil, there is potential energy, okay? There are chains of, of, of atoms, molecules that Hand are potential the mic energy. Over. And Hand the mic over. But when it's lit, though, that's when the energy comes out. The boat has left. And, and lighting is when we see Jesus. Okay. Hand so, the mic over. Sure. He's, he's good, and he has excellent detail to supply, and I love it. And normally I would be extracting all of this out of you because it's fascinating, but I simply want the explanation of the garments soaked in oil. And no one has actually mentioned 
And we've spent so much time on this. I mean, it's on the board. We've talked about it all the week. Stand up and deliver. Here's the mic there behind you. Don't feel bad, by the way, if I ask you to sit down because no one's got this yet. <laughs> Having the mind of Christ in us. Wow. It can't be true because the saints are stunned. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you're thinking. Come on. How does having the mind of Christ in us? And another word for mind, we could say the... Spirit. The, Christ, the, the, the Spirit brings into us the... Thought. The life of Christ. Thank you very much. It, it's the first time it's come out. The mind of Jesus, the life of Jesus within us. Do you want to finish the sentence? You're on a roll now. Come on. <laughs> Ooh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Having the mind of Christ in us is, is being saturated with the Holy Spirit. Of course, it's one and the Which... same thing. Everyone mentioned the Spirit, but I was waiting for someone to bring Jesus into this. It's Jesus in us. His life coming into us that transforms our filthy garments into His likeness. We've said it 500 times already. By the way, the other point that needed clarification, filthy garments soaked in oil, the living Christ is in us. We bring forth light and it reflects, it reflects the character of Jesus. He's standing in the midst of the candlesticks. One last radical thought for you all to leave with. There are how many golden candlesticks? Don't call out seven golden candlesticks in Revelation. And the number seven is a very prophetic number. It's the number of? Completeness, yes it is. It's the number of completeness. Now in Revelation 1, I want you to turn to this verse. We're going to pick up on this tomorrow. But I want you to be thinking about it overnight. Those that have strength should turn to Revelation 1 now. <laughs> Revelation 1. I can't understand these people who don't turn off their cell phones. <laughs> I thought that was good. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Revelation 1. Verse 20. A very powerful verse here, Revelation 1. Mike, you've got the mic, so stand up and read for me, would you? Verse 20, thank you. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Wow. Wow. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now the number seven, our sister here has already brought out, and of course we can trace this back to creation, this number seven. It's the number of completeness. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. There must be one person sitting in the church at this moment who is saying to themselves as their mind expands oh hallelujah that must be a picture of they don't call out now that must be a picture of because there are seven laps and seven churches it must be a picture of I'm taking hands now. 
If you can't see this, we're going to stay here even till midnight if necessary, till someone gets this. We have a very high hand in the air here. Stand up and deliver, please. It's a complete and holy picture of God. Say that again in English. It is a complete and holy picture of God. All right, he is at least on first base. <laughs> he, his mind is, I like the fact that he's got a creative mind, this guy, and he's thinking very creatively. You've only given me half the picture. And if it's a complete holy picture of God, then it's also a complete holy picture of Jesus Christ revealed in us. All right, you're giving me two thirds of the picture now. I'd love to get the whole picture out here. These are seven churches. It's um, the seven faithful witnesses. And if now that why you would change horses in midstream, you've changed horses in it, midstream. It would have to be then his people. You've still changed horses, unfortunately. Why you do not remain consistent with your first two statements boggles my mind. It's my, my ADD. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> You've done so well. You're an advanced thinker here. Okay, take a seat. Maybe someone is hearing you enough to supply us with the last little bit because the one thing he hasn't really bought into yet is the churches. And it says the seven lampstands are seven churches. Come on, who else has got a hand up here? What about this vast audience over here? Okay, where's our mic, Mike? Over here, there's a brother here on the aisle. Thank you. Listen. Shh, 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 shh. I may be wrong, but would it be us in the last church, the Laodicean church? Unfortunately, you've left seven out of your statement. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. But it's not a bad statement you've made, but you just left the number seven. I'm asking for an explanation of seven churches. Our brother here, incredibly, in a very advanced moment, has seen the complete picture of God here. Amen. And he's right. But there's something else preceding that. Now, you've already had a good slice of the pie. I'm just saying we've got some very low participants in the room. And I'm wondering if we're ever going, oh, there's a hand right at the very back, look, way back there in Siberia, okay. <laughs> Would you stand please so they can all see you, thank you. It's God's working in people's lives through each of the ages that are represented by the seven churches of Revelation. Okay, and unfortunately you That's also not... have left the number seven out of your statement. But Is it was it a good- seven? No, it's a seven churches. There's a saying, you know, quit while you're ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and the number seven has not come through. We've already looked at the symbolic significance of the number seven, but it did not come through. Is that it's what I call a tentative hand over here? I, I love it. She went like this. <laughs> but luckily I caught it. Thanks, Mike. If you'd stand so the saints can so you okay. turn that way, please. Um, we we were just talking here, so I don't know if I'm way off base or what. But the, well, it has happened before to most of us. <laughs> the the Laodicean church is now, the seventh church. Okay, and that's already been mentioned. Okay. Well, I know that was. But are you also going to join hands with those who've jumped off the bridge? Probably. By ignoring the prophetic number seven. You've just left out the prophetic meaning of the number seven in that statement, which means you've joined hands the and jumped off the same bridge. Hang on. Now, Carol, do you want to take the mic from her? Because you're feeding her pretty church. well there. Hang the on. Completeness. Hang on. And say that again, what you just said. The completeness, Listen. the church. You said it. The complete church. Amen. It takes a lot to move this crowd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Say that a little more evangelistic. I like the way you're thinking. Say it again. The complete church. Amen. The church is complete. Wow. You know, it's a very advanced thought to go together with Martin's very advanced right. thought over here. Yeah. So Are we the complete church that reveals Christ's character. Yeah, we did it. <laughs> Oh, 
Thank you so much. That, boy, I should keep you on your feet. When you're on a roll, you're on a roll. That is excellent. Are we looking at a picture of the completed church? In all her glory, bringing about a revelation or a revealing of the complete Jesus Christ himself. Wow. Wow. That's excellent. And all we've done historically is to let the number seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven periods of the church. I don't have a problem with that. I believe it's there. But the final meaning of this prophecy has to do with the theme of Revelation. Do you think it's by accident that having just said the revelation of Jesus Christ and the first prophetic picture is a picture of seven golden candlesticks filled with oil, with dirty garments torn into strips, soaked in oil, bringing forth light, reflecting Jesus. It's the first symbolic picture in the whole book of Revelation following this statement, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a magnificent picture. Praise the Lord, huh? There's a point on the oil that was missed. A point on the oil that was missed. And the garments. We will let you press this a little further for us. Okay. Please stand and deliver. Thank you. As I thought of those garments so soaked in oil, they're lit by the Holy Spirit, and the garments are consumed, those filthy oh, wow. garments. Beautiful. And replaced with? With the garments of Christ's Beautiful. righteousness. She's on a roll, isn't she? Praise the Lord. Very clear statement here. Wow. Very clear statement. And all of a sudden, the book of Revelation starts to open up like never before. Yes, we have an application way back in history. We do. But this is about God's last day people. When he finally has a people who will reveal Jesus. And their first representation is a beautiful picture. Seven golden candlesticks filled with oil. Wicks of dirty garments soaked in oil, bringing forth light, and it's all reflecting on the one standing in the center of the candlesticks. What an amazing picture this is. Huh? What an amazing picture. So the key to understanding the book of Revelation could be said to be, oh, hallelujah, you are on a roll today. <laughs> the sanctuary, she said. The key to understanding the book of Revelation, of course, it's the sanctuary. Yes, it is. What a shame we haven't got another hour or two now. Because huh? you guys are all on a roll at the moment. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's stand together as we conclude, please. Now, sister here, I'm going to ask her to conclude in prayer, if you wouldn't mind, because God has just given you such clarity of thinking at the moment. I'm praising God. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for what we've learned today, for the beautiful picture of Jesus Amen. that we have seen in the mm. sanctuary. Mm. Help mm. us to realize that this whole book is about the victory you want your people to get, mm. reflecting your glory. Amen. So help Amen. us to go away and put our filthy garments in the hands of Jesus so mm. they may be consumed with his Holy Spirit Amen. and light the world with the light of your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Go in faith, huh? God bless.